The Premier League looks more and more likely to be decided in the final weeks, as Arsenal and City played out a draw, which means that the top three remain within three points of each other. But how did both managers look to win this tactical encounter? Let's take a look starting with City who dominated the ball. Arsenal, as they tend to do, defended in a 4-4-2, with Odegaard joining the centre forward. And in most matches, their 4-4-2 tends to be quite aggressive, with the forwards looking to press the centre-backs and the pivots looking to back this up. And Arsenal did occasionally press like this in this match, but that was a rarity. This is because Pep is aware of Arsenal's 4-4-2, and if they had been this aggressive, it would have been fairly simple for City to overload them in the midfield with their usual box. But Arteta once again showed he's one of the most adaptable managers in the league as he anticipated this. So his 4-4-2 was actually fairly passive with the forwards on the pivots, allowing Rice and Jorginho to be deeper. which is one of the reasons that City actually did not build up in this traditional shape. Where we almost always see a centre-back or a full-back stepping in alongside the pivot, Pep had a different way to try and still have a midfield overload despite Arsenal having a four in that region. And that began with both Akanji and Vardiol operating as more traditional full-backs, with Kovacic deeper alongside Rodri as the second pivot. With no press, City did not need a third man in the back line for most of the match, so Gvardiol and Akanji could both provide the width, allowing both Foden and Silva, who are perfectly happy to operate as midfielders, to push into the centre and try and create a five. And this would then allow either Foden or Bernardo Silva to step in at times to create a three versus two in this first phase, allowing City to then begin to progress up the pitch. In fairness to Arsenal, they weren't completely passive and any sideways or sloppy backwards passes in the midfield were viewed as the press trigger and Odegaard and Havertz would be happy to apply pressure to force City to restart the play from Ortega. But rather than pressing, the primary way Arsenal looked to deal with this overload was by defending extremely narrow with both their wingers as well as their fullbacks dropping in making it almost impossible for men to thrive either higher in the half spaces or even when they tried to become an auxiliary pivot. In fact, Arsenal was so happy to defend narrow to have the fullbacks covering the man in the half space instead that time and again, City were able to execute the switch to Gvardio. And Arsenal did not seem too bothered by this at all. Firstly, rather than immediately cross, Gvardio would look to cut back and find a safer pass. In addition, he's not the best crosser and even if he did get the cross, Haaland is the only aerial threat and often found himself 2 versus 1 down in the box. But using Odegaard and Havertz to maintain this defensive solidity meant that Arsenal were shooting themselves in the foot when it came to attacking, as even when they won the ball, there was no one to play the ball to against the centre-backs, meaning that City could confidently counter-press and most likely win the ball and begin the play once again, which is why Arsenal struggled to get on the ball in both halves. But with Arsenal defending the centre so well, City had to find a way through, and they tried a strategy both deep and wide that had mixed success. When Arsenal were pressing higher up, the front two was fairly man-oriented on Ake and Diaz, so we'll see Ake push into more of a defensive midfield position, freeing up space here that Kovacic would look to drop into. And all of a sudden, City had an elite in-possession midfielder beginning their deep build-up play. Time and again, we could see Saka being drawn into this position, while Gvardiol had moved up higher, allowing Foden to drop into this region, often joined by De Bruyne meaning that City now had a temporary advantage on this left-hand side and could begin play and move up the pitch. Similarly, high up the pitch, Kovacic once again dropped into the left centre-back position and City's midfield could take up a variety of shapes to still maintain the double pivot. With White being narrow looking to prevent any play into the half space, it would be Saka who would be drawn into this region, again freeing up space down the left. But City was suffering as Arsenal was so content to let Vardio have the ball that these overloads rarely made a difference. And that is why Pep had to make a change. Lewis came on for the injured Ake, whilst Grealish and Doku also took to the pitch, and Pep changed his shape, with Lewis often being the secondary pivot alongside Rodri, often assisted by Silva, 
who could now operate even deeper, as Doku was the right winger. At the same time, Gvardiol was now more often in this position, as City operated with a very aggressive back three, with Akanji and Gvardiol very happy to push up into the middle and final third. What this now meant is that City would still have significant numbers in central regions, meaning that if Arsenal was still trying to defend just as narrowly, now City had two much more dangerous wide men who could get onto the ball. And down the left, this meant that White was dragged out much more often rather than just worrying about the man in the half space. And this could then potentially drag out a centre-back, leaving Haaland with the opportunity for a potential one versus one a much more favourable situation. And down the right, it was all about giving Doku one versus one situations, initially against Kivio and later Tomiyasu. And we saw Doku hit the byline a few times, but just couldn't make that tallying pass. But what were the Gunners doing in possession? Much like City, Arsenal built with just the two centre backs, which would draw the front two of City in Haaland and De Bruyne into the press. And this would at times force Arsenal long, as we saw them much more willing to do in this encounter. But the alternative to this was inviting Raya into the play and creating a wider back three. And realizing there were three versus two down, Haaland and De Bruyne would then be much less likely to press, meaning that Arsenal could then build up in a slower, composed manner. And Arsenal did have a lot of early success against City's 4-4-2, as Foden initially would be on white. However, as White pushed higher up the pitch, Foden would not track. And with Saka pinning Guardiola, White time and again was free to make the run in behind that Arsenal would look to find with the long ball, leading to threatening situations. But much like City, Arsenal did struggle to play through the centre of the pitch at times, with Kovacic and Rodri being aggressive on the Arsenal pivot when they were looking to build up, and neither White nor Kivio were inverting as Arteta was using his new 4-4-2 box shape, meaning that it was Odegaard and Havertz free higher up, and City would contract the space between the lines by pushing their back line extremely high as well. This did come with some risks, as Havertz was looking to make the runs in behind, but never came to fruition. Later on, there was a rare occasion that Arsenal took advantage of the City 4-4-2 shape, as the press was sloppy, meaning the pivot had time on the ball, and could then find Odegaard between the lines, and this was almost a moment that decided the course of the title race. But both sides struggled in attack throughout this match. An incredibly close title race continues, and with none of the top three left to play each other, it's become a case of who can remain flawless for the longest. For the manager tactical score, both sides were solid, with Arteta content with not having the ball rather than just purely being starved of it, meaning both managers earn a 5.5, but drop your ratings below. And check out this video, a tactical deep dive of the greatest Messi and Ronaldo match in history.